He's Jim Stewart, I'm Rick Collins, and this is Off the Bench. Oklahoma planting the flag at the horseshoe. That was retaliation for last year. And last year when Ohio State won at uh, Gaylord Stadium, they sang their fight song in front of the entire OU uh, Fan crowd. Base, yeah. And so this was an emotional response from Baker Mayfield. I personally enjoyed it, though he did come back and apologize uh, after uh, a day of thinking about it. I do think it was more of a thought of the future. You don't want those that conversation being discussed a couple months down the road when he's thinking about going into the draft. Absolutely, and you see more and more of these guys are really thinking about what's going to help or hurt their draft stock and thinking about it earlier on, obviously, as uh, these players, especially him, knowing he's going to be, I think, on the quarterback bubble for the NFL draft. That could make or break whether he gets you know, picked by a team that has maybe stronger moral or ethical standards than you know, we, we ha I have sources that tell me that Baker Mayfield isn't the top pick for NFL scouts. Um, but you're a homer. But so I am a homer. But, but the issue is it's, it's why give them more ammunition? Why give them more ammunition to hate on you? Yeah. You know, what, what mm -hmm. else do you have to do? He's, well, ha he's, gonna hate. he's thrown for almost 8,000 yards in two years. He's, he's been the most efficient quarterback in college football for almost two years now. He should have won the Heisman last year, but you know, the entire college world is enamored by these quarterbacks who can run and throw uh, that don't understand how to go through uh, progressions and find uh, receivers other than the first open one they look at. And really, um, I do believe that there are some there are factors that are out of his control that keep him down. But but why Heights give being one of them might <laughs> be one of them. But, you know, I, I really do see this as his chance to really um, not only win the Heisman, because he is the top of the, of the Heisman race right now, and we'll go over that in a minute, but it really allows him to put his best foot forward as not only a player on the field, but a captain in the locker room. Yeah, and I think, you know, emotions run high at the end of a game. He goes out and plants up. I really didn't have anything wrong, you know, an issue with that. I didn't see really a whole lot wrong with him doing that. Um, obviously, as we're talking about it, you, him thinking about his future, in the NFL and everything else, I can see where he might want to come back and apologize. I, he's having fun. He's a kid. He's having fun. He's not out there making a bunch of mistakes off the field. He's not flicking the camera off or anything like that, as far as I know. And, uh, you know, for him to come back and apologize for that, uh, maybe a little bit over the top, but he's doing what he thinks is necessary. And, you know, a lot of announcers and a lot of uh, analysts have really compared him to a combination of Tony Romo and Brett Favre. I see the Brett Favre in him. I see the fun. I see the in, uh, improvisation when the play arm breaks strength. down. The arm strength. He's got an arm on him. But you know what the really interesting part was? Was what does 28 and 3 mean to you? 28 and 3 means. That was the score that the that the Patriots came back last Super Bowl oh, yeah. against. That was what they ran, that was the run they had in the second half against OSU. They scored 28 uh, uh, 20 points to three. So they they really put it on to them in the second half of that game. I really think it has um, propelled him to the top of the Heisman chart, and really it's going to set the pace for the matchup he has later on in the year against OSU which uh, a lot of people believe. The other OSU, the Oklahoma other OSU. State University. Yeah. And a lot of people think that is the last hurdle they have before they go into the playoffs. So uh, I think Oklahoma will end up in the top 10. Where they end up in the top 10 will obviously be determined on how they play against Oklahoma State and then how the rest of the conference does. I think Oklahoma's biggest issue looking forward is is the Big 12 any good? Because right now, with the Bears being terrible, and they are going to be terrible, TCU's got a big match this weekend, which we're going to go over in a little bit. Texas, we don't really know. We had two now two games where they looked opposites. But it was also against a almost top 25 team and then the second-tier football. <laughs> I mean, they we, played the first. We just don't know. We, they they we played their anything. second game like they should have played their first. Yeah. And... 
I think we're gonna have we're gonna see a Big 12 that's gonna have still a down year. People thought maybe the Big 12 would c have a little bit of an up year. I still think they're not quite there yet. When you look at the ACC, the SEC, the Pac-12 is looking pretty good. I, I honestly disagree with you a little bit. I think all of football looks a little bit down. Yeah, the Power Five team, you know, the, the big top teams are looking good. But if you look into the SEC, they're having a down year. Obviously, the Big 12 is having a down year. Uh, a lot of the Big Ten teams aren't looking as powerful as they did last year. Uh, Pac-12, you know, you've got the normal names. Uh, U, uh, USC is now becoming a powerhouse again after about five or six years of mediocrity, uh, mediocrity that with Sam Darnold leading yep. the pack. Um, you know, Arizona is not an issue this year. At least no one's been talking about them. Oh, Arizona State hasn't. Uh, Washington isn't as big of a deal as they were last year. I, I think this is a bit of a down year other than the top schools. And as an OU fan, I really don't care because that just allows <laughs> them to have a better year. Well, speaking of the ACC, let's go back to the ACC. Lamar Jackson had a gigantic day on Saturday. I think it might propel him up. If it doesn't put him at Baker Mayfield level, he's very, very close. He had six touchdowns overall. He had almost 500 yards total offense, over 100 yards rushing. He had a 95.5 uh, uh, quarterback rating. That's incredible for a guy who I think a lot of people are not sure what his draft stock looks like quite yet. I think uh, I've seen this before, and it serves him well in college. I do not think it translates to the NFL at all. Uh, usually players that have unbelievably a uh, unbelievable athletic ability usually struggle when it comes to reads and being able to run a pro-style offense because they're so used to backing up. First target isn't there, second target isn't there, they take off and no one could catch him. And the last person we saw that really was that style of quarterback was um, was uh, Vince Young. Yeah. And Vince Young, you know, not saying, you know, Vince Young had had other issues that plagued him. You know, he wasn't the, he wasn't the, the greatest intellectual. Well, but again, Johnny Manziel had a chance to be something, but his off the field issues was the reason why he didn't make it, you know, his height was another one. Yeah. But I do think, and, and, and I know I'm probably in the minority here, but I do think that people look at the measurables too much. They look at height, weight, they look at speed. They don't look at the intangibles. That's why I believe Baker Mayfield will be a good quarterback <laughs> in the Always NFL. Always bringing it back to Baker yes, Mayfield. Yes, but that's another thing. If you look at, if you look at, look at Lamar Jackson, he's an athlete. Yeah. He's got a cannon for an arm. He, he's got a sprinter's legs. He's, he's quick. But the question is, when you look at the next level, he's going to do great in college because no, no, nobody can keep up with him. But what name me five players in the last 20 years that have been able to translate that kind of a quarterback's ability into the NFL. You just can't. They get killed because they're not... It's like going against an Alabama defense every single week in the NFL. They're that good, right? And I would love to see Lamar Jackson do that every single week against a Alabama defense. All right, well, defense. we'll see in a year, I'm sure. So let's look at another quarterback who is the style of quarterback you think will be successful. Let's look at Sam Darnold. He had a so-so game. Now, they were playing Stanford, which they're top 15 team in the country right now, at least based on the AP ranking. So he had a good day, not a great day. I think it drops him in the Heisman race, but USC also has a pretty difficult road to hoe. They're gonna play Texas this weekend. Now we're not sure what Texas is right now, but based on this last weekend's result, shutting out a, you know, probably a level two team, but considerably better defense than they showed against Maryland in week one. We don't know, Texas might be able to pull this out, and if they do, it's gonna be on the defensive side of the ball against Sam Darnold, and that would really drop USC's chances of winning the Pac-12 and Sam Darnold's probably chance of winning the Heisman. The issue that Texas is gonna have is they just lost their redshirt freshman guard, uh, Hudson, and uh, I don't think this is a very, very good start 
for the Tom Her um, Her Herman, <laughs> Herman era, yeah. Tom Herman era. I think USC is going to be a you know probably on the bubble or in the playoffs this year. Sam Darnold has not had a very good start to the season compared to what his hype was. Yeah. Everybody thought that he was going to come in and basically throw up, you know, Lamar Jackson numbers, but with his arm. Yeah. They thought he was going to throw four or five touchdowns a game, and he really hasn't. He's been struggling a bit. He always ends up ending the game well, but he really starts to struggle. Um, and USC the game. playing Texas, they've also got uh, Shane Bouchelle. Not sure if he's going to be healthy, and even if he is healthy, is he going to start? Uh, we don't know about that. So lastly, let's look at the local game of the week. We got SMU TCU. It's always a always a good game. TCU clearly is the better team. Can SMU make it interesting? I believe SMU can make it interesting, but it, they're going to have to do it on the offensive end. Yeah. Their defense is atrocious. Atrocious. They gave UNT almost 450 yards through the air. That's unacceptable against UNT. Yeah. Uh, SMU has made great strides the last couple years. They're starting to, and I know this has been said a couple times since the 80s, but they look like they're starting to make a comeback from, you know, uh, NF or college football purgatory. Yes. From the, from the Eric Dickerson uh, era of sanctions, they are starting to come back. It's only taken almost three decades, <laughs> but they're starting to come back. I, I do think that coming up with the TCU-SMU game, uh, I, I don't think there's much... SMU can do other than put up a fight in the first half and then get blown. So we out. see maybe a high scoring. We're talking maybe 60s to 40s, something like that. Yeah, I, it, you know TCU, their offense is good, but again they have uh, they have the the very talented but often um, underachieving player out of Kenny South Hill. Lake, Kenny Hill, Jr. Uh, I do think that. It's going to be difficult for SMU to win. I, I think they keep it close. It's just, just a talent level difference. Yeah, it's going to make a talent it really level difficult. difference. All right. Well, after the commercial break, we're going to talk more football. Next. Is it possible to have too much football? I do think we're starting to get to that point. Uh, if you break down, let's start with pros. Right now we have Thursday night football, we have Sunday night football, or Sunday football. All day Sunday. And then we have Monday night football. They are thinking about maybe in the future expanding that, I hope not. But if you really want to look at the entire scope of the amount of football we get. It's almost football overload. We go from nothing to, from the high school to the pros, we have Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday football. Five days straight of football, five. It's a little ridiculous. And we get two days to basically unwind, and I don't think that's nearly enough. Now, we did just come off a season where you have baseball every day. Of course, your team isn't necessarily playing every day. They're playing almost every day. So. Can you say the same way. Can you say that there's, yeah, exactly. So can you say that five days a week is too much football? I think it is in the sense that baseball and basketball, unless you're a hardcore fan, it almost becomes white noise. Unless it's a big matchup, you almost forget that it's baseball season. Right. There's no getting away from football. Whether it's at the local level or the pro level, it's football, 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 football in your face, and every single game matters. That's the big deal about football. Yeah. In basketball, you hear it all the time. Regular season doesn't matter. They can they can lose ten games in a row and still make it to the playoffs. And in baseball, it's even more. They can lose twenty games in a row and still make it. I mean, it'll be hard, but they still could do it. You lose two or three games in in high school, college, especially those two. But even in the pros, you lose those two. You could be out of the playoff races completely depending on what division you're in. I think it's the most difficult in college because you've got kids who are obviously student athletes, just like they are in high school. But in high school, you're playing for a state championship. You can probably afford to lose two or three games and still make it. It's possible. But when you get into college, there's so much more 
of the commercial piece around college football. And then you're playing Monetary. every weekend. You've got classes going on all the time. And you're trying to get to a bowl game, which are just as big in terms of viewership, in my opinion, as a lot of the NFL games. Maybe not the Super Bowl, but a lot of the NFL games. We really got to break this down to it's also what football has become. And college football is next. I don't know if it'll ever get to high school, but it's this fantasy football betting lifestyle that we live in. With fantasy football, every single game matters. Not only because of if you're a team or a fan, but because of your lineup. Well, not only that. So you I'm made a, a big deal. You made a big deal this weekend about yeah. your your you lost to one team that uh, really ended up. Does, you would have played any other team in your, uh, in your league, won. and you would have won. And it, and and you go through and you try to figure out what player lost it for you. And then you go and then you go look at the game. And so next time you're watching that game, hoping that player doesn't mess up again. It just it makes you have to tune into these. And games. you sit there, and the, I think. Also, the biggest piece about football is that you're sitting there for over three hours for every single game versus a soccer game, which is two hours long, versus a basketball game, which is two hours long, versus a baseball game, which you can tune in and tune out of a baseball game so easily, move around and do other stuff. But in a football game, you are locked and loaded on the couch for three plus hours. And that's, that's the difficult part of it. And as soon as that game's over, you're on to the next game, and you're sitting there for another three hours watching that game. So there are a lot of people that are sports nuts that end up staying on the couch or watching TV or going to a bar for eight hours on a day. And that's if you get to the good games. If you're, if you're someone who has to do it as a profession, you're probably 12 plus hours on a couch, not only watching pregame, but post game of every single game played, you have to wait. You have to even watch the East Coast games. And it's a, it's a, it's insanity making because you think, okay, we're going to follow college football. We're going to look at these games. We're going to follow the NFL. We're going to look at these games. We're going to follow um, high school football and look at you know the game of the week. And we're going to watch some uh, replays and highlights. And we're going to watch everything else. And it's just insanity. What are we going to do? when we don't have football every weekend we actually have to do house chores because you forget that there's a life outside of football during football season and i can only attest to being a guy and you being a guy <laughs> but it gets us in trouble with our better halves <laughs> often are you just going to sit there all day and watch football yes take the trash out go play with the kids but what happens is they don't matter at that point because our adopted kids are playing on the tv we care, that's the scary part. People care as much about their team or their players as they almost do their family, or it seems like it. People get angry when their player throws an interception. People get angry when someone gets hurt. It's not like, oh, that was, that was crazy. It was, they, it, have you ever had it where, and I've had it, where with Brett Favre and some of these OU teams, I was in a mood for a couple days. Oh, afterwards. absolutely. My, my wife wants to have nothing to do with me after a loss. I mean, absolutely nothing to do with me. I, she, she might as well send me back up there to watch more football because I am not going to be in any kind of mood to do anything for at least a few hours, if not a day. And really, other than games, other than football, what else in your life has that kind of impact? It's usually family or like some sort of horrific bill that you get. Those are the only things. And it's incredible. I, looking at all the channels that are supporting the NFL right now. I mean, ESPN has Monday Night Football. You have Fox. You have CBS. Then you got you Sunday ABC, Ticket. You have Sunday Ticket. You have the Red Zone, which, okay, now I don't have to watch the full games of all the teams. I can just go and I get to watch each time one of the teams is in the Red Zone about to score. I can watch that piece. Talk about, talk about ADHD taking over. They, they, are, they are playing on the fact that society as a whole, is, our attention spans are shrinking. You don't have to watch the mediocre, uh, the, the mediocrity of the ball going from your 20 to the other team's 20. No. Now as you just have to wait. As, as soon as they enter that other 20. Gratification only. That's all you <laughs> have to worry about. And, and in a lot of ways, that's just compounding the problem. That's why people can't sit through a baseball game anymore. They, baseball games haven't really changed. They've always been long. But in the past, people enjoyed them. 
But now because our attention spans are shrinking, we need instant gratification, whether it's a post or, or a video on Facebook, if I don't get those likes, if I don't get that instant gratification and, that, and that, uh, those endorphins running through my brain, it's, it's a waste of time. And I think that's the only reason that football is struggling is because we're seeing more of this uh, you know, supply of people with ADD being sports fans. They're wanting to get it via Twitter, which it's instant gratification. And the NFL, these games are so long that I'll tune out because, okay, now we're going to another commercial break. Now we're going to another commercial break. Now we're, the NBA really has, has it down. They don't have as many commercial breaks. When they go to commercial breaks, they're short, they come back. They're not coming back to two seconds of action and going back to commercial. The NFL has some work to do there in terms of limiting uh, how many commercial breaks they have, shortening the games, but Everything that they're doing via TV with the, with the Sunday ticket, with the red zone, it's, it's definitely making it easier to consume football right now. I think it really comes down to on those lines, is the NFL willing to have that balance of you know, entertainment and efficiency to money? Because what they're doing is they're trying to squeeze every single nickel oh, out. Yeah. And, it, and if they went the route of the NBA where they had maybe five to six breaks in a game, maybe a little bit shorter, but they were strategically placed so it wasn't like come back, a little bit of game, go back to break, they could charge more for those ads. They'll lose some money. Right. But the fans will be happier. The game will speed up. Because that is a part of why these games have slowed down. Entertainment and TV has got involved. Now they have scheduled TV breaks during games. Yeah, and it is really weird. You don't think any of it, anything of it, when you're at when you're watching games on TV. But when you go to games live, it is really weird. Yeah, everybody's just, just standing around. Nothing's happening for you know two or three. minutes. It wasn't minutes. a timeout by the team. No. They're just standing around. Half the time, the players are dancing or or. or I'm sorry, together. but it does not take two minutes for the offense to get on the field and run a play after a kickoff return. It just doesn't, but all of a sudden, now we have a two-minute commercial break right after kickoff. And it's We just came from like 20 minutes of commercials before kickoff to the kickoff for 30 seconds of action, of which, of course, there is no action nowadays because the kickoff got moved up, and they're kicking it out of the and back. And they go right back to the commercial break. Right back into commercial break. Right back into, and I don't know how this commercial came back, but right back to monkey, uh, doggy monkey baby or whatever that commercial is. It can't, it's back. Same commercial. It is scary. It's going to give children nightmares. But on that note, I think we're going to be ending today. I think we're footballed out. We are footballed out. I am footballed out. And we're going to try to recoup today and, and, and continue tomorrow. Mm -hmm.